George Hastings meets his lover And Marlowe meets his match Too soon they will discover That there may be a catch Charles Marlowe's so damn nervous And Katie is quite perplexed The gentleman quite nervous And father's very vexed And all the while my mother Refuses to concede I'd rather any other Still that's what comes of greed If I'm a man, let me have my fortune he can't, I'll not be made a fool of, no longer. Is, is this ungrateful boy, all that I am to get for the pains I have taken in your education? I that have rocked you in your cradle and fed that pretty mouth with a spoon. Did I not work that waistcoat to make you gentil? Did I not prescribe for you every day and weep while the dosage was operating? He caught you had reason to weep. For you have been dosing me ever since I was born. I have gone through every dosage in the complete housewife ten times over. And your thoughts of coursing me through Quincy next spring? But you can't, I tell you, I'll not be made a fool of no longer. Oh, wasn't it all for your good, Viper? <laughs> wasn't it all for your good? I wish you'd let me and my good alone then. Snubbing this way when I'm in spirits. If I'm to have any good, let it come of itself. Not to keep digging it and digging it into one zoo. Oh, that's false. I never see you when you're in spirits. No, Tony, you, you then go to the alehouse at the kennel. I'm never to be delighted by your agreeable wild notes, unfeeling monster. You can't, Mama. Your own notes are the wildest of the two. <gasps> Was ever the like? But I see he wants to break my heart. I see he does. Dear madam, permit me to lecture the young gentleman a little. I'm certain I can persuade him of his duties. Well, I must retire. Come, Constance, my love. Do you see, Mr. Hastings, the wretchedness of my situation? Was ever a poor woman so plagued with a dear, sweet, pretty, provoking, undutiful boy? <laughs> there was a young man riding by and fain would have his way. Ring ding diddle dee. Don't mind her. Let her cry. It's the comfort of her heart. I've seen her and her sister cry over a book for an hour together. And they said they liked the book the better the more it made them cry. Then you're no friend of the ladies, I find, my pretty young gentleman. That's as I find them. Not to her of your mother's choosing, I dare answer. Yet, she appears to me a pretty, well tempered girl. That's because you don't know her as well as I. I know every inch about her. There's not a more bitter, cantankerous toad in all Christendom. Pretty encouragement this for a lover. I've seen her since the height of that. She has as many tricks as a hare in a thicket, or a colt the first day's breaking. To me, she appears sensible and silent. Aye, oh, before company. But when she's with her playmate, she's as loud as a hog in a gate. But there is a meek modesty about her that charms me. Aye. But curb her never so little, she kicks up, you're flung in a ditch. Well, you must allow her a little beauty. Yes, you must allow her some beauty. Bandbox. She's all a made-up thing, man. Ah, if you could see Bet bounce through these parts, you might then talk of booty. Ecod, she has two eyes as black as sloes, and cheeks as broad and red as a pulpit cushion. She'd make two, is she? Well... What say you to a friend that would take that bitter bargain off your hands? Anon. Would you thank him that would take Miss Neville and leave you to happiness and your dear Betsy? Aye. But where is there such a friend? For who would take her? I am he. If you'll but assist me, I'll engage to whip her off to France and you shall never hear more of her. Assist you? Ecod, I will. To the last drop of my blood. I'll clap a pair of horses to your chaise that shall trundle you off in a twinkling and maybe get you a part of her fortune in jewels beside that you little dream of. My dear squire, this looks a lad of spirit. Come along then. 
You shall see more of my spirit before you're done with me. We are the boys that fear no noise as the thundering cannon roar. <laughs> the modestest young man in town. To me, he appears the most impudent piece of brass that ever spoke with a tongue. He has taken possession of the easy chair by the fireside already. He took off his boots in the parlor and desired me to see them taken care of. I'm desirous to know how his impudence affects my daughter. She will certainly be shocked at it. Well, my Kate, I see you have changed your dress as I bid you. Yet I believe there was no great occasion. I find such a pleasure, sir, in obeying your commands that I take care to observe them without ever debating their propriety. And yet, Kate, I sometimes give you some cause, particularly when I recommend my modest gentleman to you as a lover today. You taught me to expect something extraordinary. I find the original exceeds the description. I was never so surprised in all my life. He has quite confounded all my faculties. I never saw anything like it. And a man of the world, too. Ah, you learnt it all abroad. What a fool was I to think that a young man could learn modesty by travelling. He might as well learn wit at a masquerade. It seems all natural to him. A good deal assisted by bad company and a French dancing master. I'm sure you mistake, Papa. A French dancing master could never have taught him that timid look, that awkward address, that bashful manner. Whose look? Whose manner, child? Mr Marlowe's. His mauvaise honte. His timidity struck me at the first sight. Then your first sight deceived you. For I think him one of the most brazen first sights that ever astonished my senses. Sure you rally, sir. I never saw anyone so modest. And can you be serious? I never saw such a bouncing, swaggering puppy since I was born. Bully Dawson was but a fool to him. Surprising. He met me with a respectful bow a stammering voice and a look fixed on the ground. He met me with a loud voice, a, a lordly air, and a familiarity that made my blood freeze again. He treated me with diffidence and respect. He censured the manners of the age, admired the prudence of girls that never laughed, tired me with apologies for being tiresome, then left with a bow, and, madam, I would not for the world detain you. He spoke to me as if he knew me all his life before, asked 20 questions and never waited for an answer, interrupted my best remarks with some silly pun, and when I was in my best story of the Duke of Marlborough and Prince Eugene, he asked if I'd not a good hand at making punch. There's Kate. He asked your father if he was a maker of punch. One of us must certainly be mistaken. If he be what he has shown himself, I'm determined he shall never have my consent. If he be the sullen thing I take him, he shall never have mine. In one thing, then, we are agreed. To reject him. Yes. but upon conditions. For if you should find him less impudent, and I more presuming, if you find him more respectful and I more importunate, I, I don't know. The fellow is well enough for a man, and certainly we don't meet many such at a horse race in the country. If we should find him so, but well, that's impossible. No, the first appearance has done my business. I'm seldom deceived in that. And yet there may be many good qualities under that first appearance. Aye, when a girl finds a fellow's outside to her taste, she then sets about guessing the rest of his furniture. With her, a smooth face stands for good sense and a genteel figure for every virtue. I hope, sir, a conversation begun with a compliment to my good sense won't end with a sneer at my understanding. Pardon me, Kate. But if young Mr Brazen can find the art of reconciling contradictions, he may 
please us both, perhaps? And as one of us must be mistaken, what if we go to make further discoveries? Agreed. But depend on it. I'm in the right. And depend on it. I'm not much in the wrong. <laughs> Cold, I have got them. Here they are, my cousin Con's necklaces, bobs and all. My mother shan't cheat the poor souls out of their fortune, me. Oh, my Janice, is that you? My dear friend, how have you managed with your mother? I hope you have amused her with pretending love for your cousin and that you are willing to be reconciled at last. Our horses will be refreshed in a short time and we shall soon be ready to set off. And it's something to bear your charges by the way. Your sweetheart's jewels. Keep them and hang those, I say, that would rob you of one of them. But how have you procured them from your mother? Ask me no questions and I'll tell you no fibs. I have procured them by the rule of thumb. If I had not a key to every drawer in Mother's bureau, how could I go to the alehouse so often as I do? An honest man may rob himself of his own at any time. Thousands do it every day. But to be plain with you, Miss Neville is endeavouring to procure them from her aunt this very instant. If she succeeds, it will be the most delicate way at least of obtaining them. Well, keep them till you know how it will be. But I know how it will be well enough. She'd as soon part with the only sound tooth in her head. <laughs> But I dread the effects of her resentment when she finds she has lost them. Never you mind her resentment. Leave me to manage that. I don't value her resentment in the bounce of a cracker. Soon, here they are. Morris, France. Indeed, Constance, you amaze me. Such a girl as you want jewels. <laughs> There'd be time enough for jewels, my dear. Twenty years hence when your beauty begins to want repairs. But what will repair beauty at 40 will certainly improve it at 20, madam. Yours, my dear, can admit of none. That natural blush is beyond a thousand ornaments. Besides, child, jewels are quite out of present. And don't you see half the ladies of our acquaintance, my lady Kildaylight and, and Mrs Crump and the rest of them, carry their jewels to town and bring nothing but paste and marker seeds back? But who knows, madam? But somebody that shall be nameless would like me best with all my little finery about me. <laughs> Consult your glass, my dear, and then see if with those eyes you want any better sparklers. <laughs> what do you think, Tony, my dear? Does, does your cousin Khan want jewels in your eyes to set off her beauty? That's as thereafter, maybe. My dear aunt, if you knew how it would oblige me. A parcel of old-fashioned rolls and table-cut things. <laughs> they would make you look like the court of King Solomon at a puppet show. <laughs> Besides, I, I believe I can't readily come at them. They may be missing for all I know to the contrary. Oh. <sighs> Then why don't you tell her so at once as she's so longing for them? Tell her they're lost. It's the only way to quiet her. Say they're lost. Call me to bear witness. You know, my dear, I'm only keeping them for you, so... <laughs> so if I say they're gone, you'll bear me witness, will you? Never fear me. Ecod, I'll say I saw them taken out with my own eyes. I desire them but for a day, madam. Just to be permitted to show them as relics, and then they may be locked up again. To be plain with you, my dear Constance, if, if I could find them, you should have them. They're missing, I assure you. Lost for all I know, but we must have patience wherever they are. I'll not believe it. This is but a shallow pretense to deny me. I know they're too valuable to be so slightly kept and as you are to answer for the law. Don't be alarmed, Constance. If they be lost, I must restore an equivalent. Uh, but my son knows they're missing and not be found. That I can bear witness to. They are missing and not to be found. I'll take my oath on it. You must learn resignation, my dear. For though we lose our fortune, yet we should not lose our patience. See me, how calm I am. Aye. People are generally calm at the misfortunes of others. No, I wonder. A girl? Of your good sense should waste a thought upon such trumpery. 
We shall soon find them. And in the meantime, you shall make use of my garnets till your jewels be found. I detest garnets. Most becoming things in the world to set off a clear complexion. You've often seen how well they look upon me. You shall have them. I dislike them of all things. You shan't stir. Was ever anything so provoking as to mislay my own jewels and force me to wear her trumpery? Don't be a fool. If she gives you the garnets, take what you can get. The jewels are your own already. I've stolen them from her burrow and she does not know it. Fly to your spark, he'll tell you more of the matter. Leave me to manage her. My dear cousin. Vanish. She's there and has missed them already. How she fidgets and spits about like a Catherine wheel. Nine thieves! Robbers! Who was she in? London! Oh, oh, London! What's the matter? What's the matter, Mama? Hope nothing's happened to any of the good family. Well, we're robbed. My burrow's been broke open, the jewels taken out, and, I, and I'm undone. Oh, is that all? <sighs> By the laws, I never saw it better acted in all my life. Econ, I thought you was ruined in earnest. Hey boy, I am ruined in earnest. My burrow has been broke <laughs> open and all taken away. Stick to that. Stick to that. I'll bear witness, you know. Call me to bear witness. I tell you, Tony, by all this precious, the jewels are gone and I shall be ruined forever. Sure, I know they're gone and I'm to say so. Oh, my dearest Tony, but hear me. They're gone, I say. By the laws, Mama, you make me fall to laugh. <laughs> I know who took them well enough. <laughs> Was there ever such a blockhead that can't tell the difference between jest and earnest? I tell you, I am not in jest, Bobe. That's right, that's right. You must be in a bit of passion and then nobody will suspect either of us. I'll bear witness that they are gone. Was there ever such a cross-grained brute that won't hear me? Can you bear witness that you're no better than a fool? Was ever poor woman so beset with fools on one end and thieves on another? I can bear witness to that. You bear witness again, you blockhead, you, and I'll turn you out of the house directly. <gasps> My poor niece wants to become a man. Did you laugh, <laughs> you unfeeling brute, as if you enjoyed my distress? I can bear witness to that. You insult me, monster. I'll teach you to fetch your mother, I will. I can bear witness to that. Unaccountable creature is that brother of mine. <laughs> to send him to the house as an inn. <laughs> I don't wonder at his impudence. Oh, but what's more, madam, the young gentleman, as you passed by in your peasant dress, asked me if you were the barmaid. <laughs> he was like you for a barmaid, madam. Did he? Then as I live, I'm resolved to keep up the delusion. Tell me, Pimple, how do you like my present dress? Do you think I look something like Cherry in the Bow Stratagem? <laughs> it's the dress, madam, that every lady wears in the country, but when she visits or receives company. And you're sure he does not remember my face or person? Certain of it. I know I thought so. For though we talked for some time together, yet his fears were such he'd never once looked up during the interview. Indeed, if he had, my bonnet would have kept him from seeing me. But well, what do you hope from keeping him in his mistake? In the first place, I shall be seen. And that's no small advantage to a girl who brings her face to market. Then I shall perhaps make an acquaintance. And that's no small victory gained over one who never addresses any but the wildest of her sex. But my chief aim is to take my gentleman off his guard. And like an invisible champion of romance, examine the giant's force before I offer to combat. And you're sure you can act your part and disguise your voice so that he may mistake that as he has already mistaken your person? Never fear me. I think I have got the true bar count. Oh. <laughs> Did you run a call? <laughs> I turned the lion there. Pipes and a backer for the angel. <laughs> the lamb has been outrageous yeah. this half hour. <laughs> it will do, madam. Sure. But he's here. Hastings? 
What a bawling in every part of the house. I have scarce a moment's repose. If I go to the best room, there I find my host and his story. If I fly to the gallery, there we have my hostess with her curtsy down to the ground. I have at last got a moment to myself. And now, for recollection. Did you call, sir? Did you want a call? As for Miss Hardcastle, she's too grave and sentimental for me. Did you want a call? No, child. Besides, from the glimpse I had of her, I think she squints. I'm sure, sir, I heard the bell ring. No, no. I have pleased my father, however, by coming down, and I'll tomorrow please myself by returning. Perhaps the other gentleman called, sir. I tell you, no. I should be glad to know, sir. We have such a parcel of servants. No, no, I tell you. Yes, child, I, I think I did call. I wanted... I wanted... I vow, child, you are vastly handsome. Oh, Lassa, you make one ashamed. I never saw a more sprightly, malicious eye. Yes, yes, my dear, I did call. Have you got any of your... what do you call it, in the house? Oh, no, sir, we've been out that these ten days. One may call in this house, I find, to very little purpose. Suppose I should call for a taste, just by way of a trial, of the nectar of your lips. Perhaps I might be disappointed in that, too. Mm, nectar. Nectar. Mm, that's a liquor there's no call for in these parts. French, I suppose. We keep no French wines here, sir. Of true English growth, I assure you. Well, then it's odd I should not know it. We brew all sorts of wines in this house, and I have lived here these 18 years. 18 years? Why, one would think, child, you kept the bar before you were born. How old are you? Oh, sir, I must not tell my age. They say women and music should never be dated. To guess at this distance, you can't be much above 40. Yet, nearer... I don't think so much. By coming close to some women, they look younger still. But when we come very close indeed... Pray, sir, keep your distance! One would think you wanted to know one's age as they do horses, by mark of mouth. I protest, child, you use me extremely ill. If you keep me at this distance, how is it possible you and I can ever be acquainted? And who wants to be acquainted with you? I want no such acquaintance, not I. I'm sure you did not treat Miss Hardcastle that was here a while ago in this obstropolous manner. I warrant me before her, you looked dashed and kept bowing to the ground and taught for all the worlds if you was before a justice of the peace. Egad, she's hit it, sure enough. In awe of her, child? <laughs> a mere awkward, squinting thing? No, no, I find you don't know me. I laughed and rallied her a little, but I was unwilling to be too severe. No, I could not be too severe. Curse me. Oh, then, so you are a favourite, I find, among the ladies. Yes, my dear, a great favourite. And yet, hang me, I can't see what they find in me to follow. At the ladies' club in town, I'm called their agreeable rattle. Rattle, child, is not my real name, but one I'm known by. My name is... Solomons, Mr. Solomons, my dear, at your service. Oh, so you were introducing me to your club? Not yourself. And you're so great a favourite there, you say? Yes, my dear. There's Mrs. Mantrap, Lady Betty Blackleg, the Countess of Sligo, Mrs. Longhorns, old Biddy Buckskin, and your humble servant keep up the spirit of the place. Ah, oh, then it's a very merry place, I suppose. Yes, as merry as cards, suppers, wine, and old women can make us. <laughs> and their agreeable rattle. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't quite like this chit. She looks knowing, methinks. You laugh, <laughs> child? I can't but laugh to think what time they all have for minding their work or their family. All's well. She don't laugh at me. Do you ever work, child? Aye, sure. There's not a quilt or a screen in the whole house but what can bear witness to that. Odd so. Then you must show me your embroidery. 
I embroider and draw patterns myself a little. If you want to judge of your work, you must apply to me. Aye, but the colours don't look well by candlelight. You shall see all in the morning. And why not now, my angel? Such beauty fires beyond the power of resistance. Sure, the father here. My old luck, I never nicked seven that I did not throw Amy's ace three times following. So, madam, so, I find this is your modest lover, this your humble admirer that kept his eyes fixed on the ground and only adored at humble distance. Kate, Kate, art thou not ashamed to deceive your father Shh, so? Shh, never trust me, dear Papa, but he's still the modest man I first took him for. You'll be convinced of it, as well as I. Of my body, I believe his impudence is infectious. Didn't I see him seize your hand? Didn't I see him haul you about like a milkmaid? And you talk of his respect and his modest forces? But if I shortly convince you of his modesty, that he has only faults that will pass off with time and the virtues that will improve with age, I hope you'll forgive him. The girl would actually make one run mad. I tell you, I'll not be convinced. I am convinced. He has scarcely been three hours in the house and he has already encroached on all my prerogatives. You may like his impudence and call it modesty, but my son-in-law, madam, must have very different qualifications. So I ask but this night to convince you. You shall not have half the time, for I have thoughts of turning him out this very hour. Give me that hour, then, and I hope to satisfy you. Well, an hour let it be, then. But I'll have no trifling with your father. All fair and open. Do you mind me? I hope, sir, that you have ever found that I considered your commands as my pride. For your kindness is such that my duty as yet had been inclination. You surprise me. Sir Charles Marlowe expected here, this night. Where have you had your information? You may depend upon it. I just saw his letter to Mr. Hardcastle in which he tells him he intends setting out a few hours after his son. Then my Constance almost be completed before he arrives. He knows me, and should he find me here, would discover my name and perhaps my designs to the rest of the family. The jewels, I hope, are safe? Yes. Yes, I've sent them to Marlowe, who keeps the keys of our baggage. In the meantime, I'll go to prepare matters for our elopement. I've had the squire's promise of a fresh pair of horses, and if I should not see him again, We'll write him further directions. Well, success attend you. In the meantime, I'll go amuse my aunt with the old pretense of a violent passion for my cousin. <laughs> I wonder what Hastings could mean by sending me so valuable a thing as a casket to keep for him when he knows the only place I have is the seat of a postcoach at an inn door. Have you deposited the casket with the landlady, as I ordered you? Have you put it into her own hands? Yes, Your Honour. She said she'd keep it safe, did she? Yes, she said she'd keep it safe enough. Mm. She asked me how I came by it, and she said she had a great mind to make me give an account of myself. They're safe, however. What an unaccountable set of beings we have got amongst. This little barmaid, though, runs in my head most strangely. Mm -hmm.